certification partners. We're here today with Dr. James Stanger and Stephen Schneider to discuss the latest in our CIW series of webinars. Today's topic is Going Mobile, Design and Development Tips for Today's Platform. James, good morning. Good morning, uh, Elisa. Good to, good to talk with you. And Stephen, good morning to you. Good morning, James. Good morning, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, I'm calling in from Seattle, and we have Lisa from Phoenix. And Stephen, you're the road man today. You are calling in from Asheville, North Carolina. Is that right? I am. I am at the uh, North Carolina Computer Instructors Association annual conference. Uh, I'm going to be out All here right. for two days. Yeah. yeah. Good to have good to have you out there. I just got back myself from North Dakota, of all places. So I had a very good. A series of meetings, uh, so it's uh, it's gone very well. Well, everybody, I'm glad to have you uh, uh, on board here. You're going to hear from uh, Stephen and myself talking about what it means to develop for mobile platforms. We're going to talk about things such as appropriate target screen sizes. Uh, we're going to talk about some expert uh, advice that we've gotten from experts and talking with them about what they do when they develop for mobile environments and then some of the development environments that are out there. Then we're going to go over some good and bad examples of mobile websites uh, and, and then finally talk about how you can get there with CIW. First, uh, just a bit of a note about uh, who we are. Uh, let me start uh, here uh, with Stephen actually first. Stephen is our certification specialist. Uh, uh, he's our, our man in the field, an author and educator. Uh, he helps uh, me design the certifications and, and the courseware that we uh, that we provide and implement programs worldwide. Stephen, you've what, been to the UK, India, uh, and Asheville, North Carolina, right? And, and Asheville, all that's over. right. Can't forget that. Now. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and every now and then, uh, um, Arizona. <laughs> Every now and again, yeah, you'll be there, what, in another uh, two weeks? Is that right? Yeah, a couple of weeks. We'll both be down there. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'll both be down there. It'll be great. And then uh, you and I are going to be in Chicago at the uh, BPA show at the end of the month. Is that right? Yes, the Business Professional yeah. of America, their national conference. Yeah, so that's going to be a lot of fun, too. And you can follow Stephen at, uh, at CIW underscore instructor. Uh, I'm president and chief certification architect of uh, of certification partners. I've uh, worked a lot uh, as a technologist, a consultant, and author working for Linux Pro Magazine and uh, working in the CompTIA IT Pro community. And so um, we both work with the CIW certification, which certification partners own, the skills-based education program. It's vendor neutral. We focus on providing a holistic approach to where people learn about the skills that are important to a web designer, to a web developer, to somebody who's securing a web presence. We provide courses and certification exams uh, in web development and design. And our approach to skills-based vendor neutral education puts people on a lifelong learning path, not, not a vendor's product treadmill. We focus on open source tools as well as the best applications from anywhere, from Microsoft, from uh, Adobe, uh, as judged by industry. And we have over 65,000 certified individuals and, and uh, hundreds of thousands, almost a million, courses and exams delivered worldwide. As a result of our approach, uh, Internet.com has named us a, a top developer cert and recommends us as one of the top five certs you can get to put yourself on a fast track as a developer. Uh, and when you combine in-demand skill sets and proven salary impact, CIW uh, uh, ranks in there with uh, with the very with the very best because we are. Well, let's talk a bit, Stephen, about what it means to mobilize ourselves on the on the web and plan a strong user experience. Stephen, tell me what platform do you use when you are you know when you're when you're mobile besides your desktop? I use an I tend to use an Android smartphone, an HTC phone. How about you? I am a, I am an Android user myself. Yes, I've got the I've got the Droid. That's pretty much uh, what what keeps me connected. Um, and yep. then when I'm driving, it keeps my wife connected. So, <laughs> okay, yes, <laughs> these these things are very important, and I do the same thing. My son is an iPad, uh, an i uh, phone user, and I'm looking to get myself a tablet here uh, pretty soon. When I say pretty soon, within the next, you know, like five years, you know, you know, very soon. And what I've noticed is, uh, you know, for you personally, how often are you browsing the web on your phone as opposed to? On a the notebook, uh, on your notebook uh, computer, or on a standard desktop. I, I think the majority of the time I'm on a phone. 
Dave, that, that really depends on, on where we are and what we're doing. Um, yeah, yes, sure. when, 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 for instance, here at this conference, uh, just since I've been here, I've been using my phone a lot. And it, 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 you know, if, you're, if you're mobile, if you're doing things, you're, you're looking for uh, information, you're on, you're on your phone or, or on your tablet. I don't have a tablet. Um, um, maybe you know, I can contact our president of the company and talk him into one. But um, you know, right now, <laughs> so I, I just use my phone a lot. Yeah. Well, what I've noticed is that we have, uh, in doing some research here, 66 percent of Americans at, in, at any Americans at any rate between 24 and 35, a very fairly coveted demographic, they own a mobile phone. And over a quarter of the 4 billion phones used in the world are smartphones. Half of the searches that are happening right now are done using a mobile device. Within five years, the majority of web traffic will be done via some sort of mobile device, a tablet. By 2016, we're finding, according to DGR.com, that low-cost tablets and phones are going to control the market. And what does this mean for you as a developer and as a designer? It means it's going to be the, um, the de facto platform out there. And so design and development will be fundamentally for mobile devices. It's not an afterthought. And I think it's basically going to fundamentally uh, change, if it already hasn't, how we think. And so, Stephen, uh, this, this slide here, I'm, I'm trying to show everybody how we have to reconsider how we think when we're uh, when we're talking about mobile development, when, when, we, when we think about a mobile phone. The mobile phone or the tablet is a very tactile environment. Uh, you really don't do clicking anymore, do you, right? You tap, right? You're using your finger, right? Uh, you're pinching and zooming when you are resizing that window, okay? You're doing things like swiping, okay? You're doing all these different things. And so as you approach things as a developer when you're, when you're coding links, and, and when you're coding pages, you have to consider the user's experience from that perspective. Uh, gestures are very important. Uh, also, when you think about multitasking, um, I suppose it's not non-existent on a tablet or a, uh, a mobile phone, but I think that it's very important to understand that your, the phones are a lot less powerful, and so are the tablets. And so some of the uh, things that you typically are accustomed to providing on a traditional web page, you can't do them as, as much. And so you can't uh, do a lot of heavy, uh, as heavy programming uh, and expect a lot of, of heavy, uh, whether it be Java stuff or you know, Flash is certainly controversial, as we'll see. Um, you have to be very careful because there are certain limitations to your environment. Uh, you know what I mean, Stephen? I, I, it's that type of fundamental change in your thinking I think is very important uh, you know, right up front. Well, James, you're absolutely, absolutely correct. It's all about the user experience on the mobile platform, and it's just like what the question you were just asked: when when do I use my mobile device? How often do I find myself on my mobile device? And it really is about that user experience. When you're designing a website for someone that's sitting on their home computer or their laptop, you know what are they doing? They're typically in a comfortable chair or in a comfortable environment. You know, typically doing multitasking. They're, they may be listening to music, watching video, tweeting at the same time they're surfing through the website. Whereas someone that's on the mobile device, you know, typically they're going to be, well, mobile. And they're going to be, you know, at a bus stop, they're going to be on a subway trying to find directions or look for something, maybe low lighting conditions, uh, or maybe bright mm -hmm. lighting conditions out in sunlight. So there's, there's a lot of things that you need to take into consideration for the user experience. A very good point. Yeah, I think it's uh, you know the nature of the platform itself is something where you have processing strength and speed is an issue. They're not as fast or as powerful. You can't throw too much at it. Also, three and four G networks, uh, as cool as they are, don't get me wrong. I'm glad we have them, but they're not as fast as a wired or Wi-Fi network in general, right? Uh, theoretically, certainly they can scream along, but uh, I've done a lot of traveling. Of course, Stephen, you have. Uh, <laughs> Those networks just are never as fast as you want them to be. So you have less real estate available. And like you said, Stephen, you know, direct sunlight, that's always an issue with any of these, um, with any of these phones. And what does that mean? Is, you know, why is that important as a designer? It's precisely this. We might like to use more pastels. We might like to use certain colors in a web page, uh, in a mobile page. They just might not work very well for people who have uh, tablets or uh, phones that are moving around a lot. 
Right? And you know, not all those displays are that wonderful iPad retina that gives you that wonderful canvas you know, to, <laughs> uh, to use. And uh, it's important to, to understand, uh, as you said, Stephen, uh, you know, your audience. So it's just those fundamental changes that I think right away uh, I want to talk about. Let's talk a bit about resolutions. Uh, you know, Stephen, uh, you know, in our CIW books, we have all sorts of discussions in there about you know, screen sizes, right? And uh, the screen size on the, on the left is, is designed to show you know, the, the you know, semi-typical or the typical resolutions that you would expect right? on, a, on a notebook computer, 640 by 480, 800, uh, 1024, moving on up the, up, up the scale. Look onto the uh, look onto the right. You know, there's your typical iPhone. Uh, I don't know anybody uses the Palm Trio anymore, but the typical iPhone sizes, and and uh, you'll also see typical uh, Android sizes generally. But that's the development environment that you're going to be in and designing for. And so I think it's important to understand and get a get a sense of of where you need to be and where your mind needs to be in terms of how can you properly fill that space up. So that is usable. I mean, Stephen, haven't you seen sites before on your on your phone that you know it was clear <laughs> that the uh, that the designer uh, was far too ambitious, right? You know, trying to put too much too much in there. Far too ambitious, or just very yeah. lazy, and just trying to make the existing <laughs> desktop site fit into the mobile site. I, I love that. You've got examples coming up here, and yeah, yeah, they're coming up. Yeah, yeah, they're coming up. So again, uh, what platform are you designing to? Which is another way of asking, well, who is your audience? Okay, you you need to get a, an idea. If if you're lucky enough to say, oh, we're doing all to people who are using Samsung Android devices, then you pretty much know where those pixels are going to be and what you need to be doing things for. But consider that uh, it, it's certainly a very uh, how do you want to call it, uh, divided market. People are able to choose any phone they want. They're going to be iPhones. They're going to be Nokia's, HTC's, uh, even Blackberries. I suppose some people still buy those. Um, it's very important to understand the typical, you know, resolutions and, and the typical sizes that are out, that are out there. And so uh, uh, we wanted to provide here uh, with this slide an idea uh, of some of the typical environments out there. And uh, uh, just a reminder, everybody, you're going to get a copy of this stuff. Uh, of this PowerPoint slide, so you can you can have it and, and use it. Well, when it comes to tablets, I mean, we all uh, at least many people have heard about the new uh, iPad Retina display and how cool that is, how large it is. And by the way, Stephen, what do you think? I mean, why is it the new iPad? Why don't they call it the iPad Three officially, anyway? I and mean, that's what everybody's calling it, right? That, that's that's yeah, I believe so. It, it's what people are calling it. That's, it's it's Apple marketing. <laughs> Yeah, hey, you know, who, who, who am I to disagree, I guess? But I mean, anyway, uh, the great thing about the, uh, the um, retina display is that it's an example of some of the workarounds that uh, you have to do as a designer and a developer. Um, um, uh, looking up a person named Adrian uh, Rosselli, I have some tips about uh, developing to the, uh, to the retina. When you think that you have that huge screen, that really good looking screen that you can develop to, Think about that of the applications that you design. Uh, things are so efficient nowadays, no matter what language you're using. But it's still very important to understand that um, uh, when you are using the retina, you're likely going to use JavaScript as a way to, to sense that, that um, somebody is, a, is using <clears throat> your page using a uh, retina, uh, an iPad retina display. Uh, so you can't provide that high resolution environment to every device. You're probably going to use JavaScript or some sort of language to auto-detect that. Uh, so you kind of are working uh, using a workaround here. But all workarounds have trade-offs because it's going to require a certain amount of processing time that might slow things down. But it's not just about the retina, of course. Uh, uh, there are plenty of Android tablets running around here. So when you're, de when you're designing for a, a tablet, it's very important to understand that you are going to have to adjust your programming uh, for multiple environments. And so there are a lot of uh, sizes available here. Uh, you, you have a smaller size. You have uh, what at least some people consider a normal phone size. And then the large size there, to me, that is uh, something that is a fairly typical smartphone size. And then you have, um, but really, that's really designed to show the uh, kind of a large uh, uh, tablet. Or, the size there, and then you have the uh, the extra large, you know, nice, 
spacious tablet. Think of it this way: if you're not considering, uh, you know, if you're not considering the the uh, actual environment that you're in, you you may end up uh, designing for something that's too small, and your resolution will appear really, really odd on on a larger uh, tablet. So it's very important to understand that the the sizes are uh, are, are very important. Um, to consider. All right, now design trends. We've been uh, talking with a few experts, and they've basically said that the key is HTML5, CSS3, and jQuery. jQuery basically being the uh, the AJAX library. Now, Stephen, um, you've seen that in our uh, new site development associate uh, course that we've exactly moved to exactly those things, right? HTML5, CSS3, and jQuery. Uh, what I want to do here on this slide here is talk a bit about some of the tools and trends that are available to us. Um, Stephen, when it comes to HTML5, what are some of the really cool things that, that we can use uh, in a mobile environment? You know, things, for, for example, you've got the Canvas element, we've got uh, yeah, uh, offline yeah. storage, we have a lot of different things, yeah. Well, it's a bit yeah. more of them. Well, you know, it has the ability to build in different APIs for different types of environments for, for tools and services. For instance, uh, right. like what you mentioned, the Canvas, um, the canvas element that allows you basically to be able to open up a window to play uh, media in through it um, and mm -hmm. with, without having the requirement of an additional player or plug-in uh, to, to be installed in it. So that definitely helps speed things up. Uh, the geolocation uh, tracking element that's in there that, that again, helps provide the sense of, 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 of where you are. And, of course, most of our mobile phones or mobile devices now have that ability you know, built into them for finding information, for finding direction, for placing where you are. So a lot of these tools and skill sets are also you know, built in or ingrained basically now into HTML5. And, and with using JavaScript and CSS3, there's a lot more functionality that we can actually provide and build into our development of our site. And for mobile users, that makes it uh, that's incredibly more important to us because we are talking about, you know, on a mobile device, probably intermittent connectivity, you know, and as you mentioned, yep. not nearly as much speed uh, for connectivity, so that affects download time, uh, displaying of information. And so using these technologies can help make the site more efficient. You know, and it's all about and being embedded, really. I mean, with HTML5, notice that uh, once you have browsers uh, that are on, most phones have browsers that are HTML5 uh, compatible, you've got the embedded ability to do video. Uh, with CSS3, it, it, the browser is already capable of handling the request that you are going to do in automatically resizing tables, automatically resizing pages. With jQuery, again, you have uh, effectively an embedded library right? that makes it possible to do a lot of fancy things from screen resolution detection um, and other things that will, allow, uh, uh, that will allow you to develop to the right platform. Also, there's mobile topography kits that are available, Typekit and Google Font. This is these are very important tools because they make it possible for your uh, for the fonts that you use on a um, a mobile page to look good from one platform to the next. And that's really important. So, uh, when doing design, there are a couple of trends to think about. First of all, give priority to important messages, and I. I, I, I capitalized important there just kind of as, as a semi-joke. Uh, I've noticed people still do, if they think a word is important, they'll capitalize it for no reason. Um, when I say important messages, when you're designing uh, uh, for a mobile page, you've got really limited real estate, no matter how big uh, that display is. So think about what your company is trying to do or what you are trying to do as an individual and think very carefully about that particular message. Uh, and position it in the best spot, whether it be at the very top if you're doing a list, or whether it be in the middle of the page itself, or the middle of the, of the device that somebody brings up that page, it's very important. Use text, don't just stick with images. A lot of people like to put you know, really cool looking images because they know it's easy to, to size them and uh, resize them depending on what the platform is. Uh, that's bad for SEO. Uh, is one thing, but also uh, those images are not as interactive and not as uh, good looking as you think they are. They tend to make your, your site look a little static. It's also going to affect the uh, way the page loads as well because you know with more images that you've got yeah. on the page, you're sending out more HTTP requests, 
And so again, mm -hmm. you know, depending on on where you are, your inner your your connectivity, uh, that that's going to affect the page overall. Yeah, you know, that's right, Stephen. You know, we've seen uh, in a lot of competitions, for example. Uh, whether it be community college competitions or ones that are coming up for the DPA, we've seen a lot of students be very reliant on images. And, and you're right, it has a, a problem with downloads, and, and a lot of times students won't even bust that image up into individual pieces. You've just got this huge thing coming in downloading over that 3G connection or over that, that Wi-Fi connection, and it, it's a real problem. Well, people have taken uh, broadband connectivity for granted now, and and again, as you mentioned earlier, you know, with 3G and 4G, it's not nearly as fast. So it's understanding the content. Um, again, getting back to what you said, you know, knowing your audience, what type of information yeah. does the audience want to or is going to expect off of the website on the mobile platform, and then providing those links. And then you've got a great uh, bullet point in here: increase button sizes or hyperlink sizes. Yeah. Why is that? Well, because we're 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 tapping on our screen instead of clicking, so it's a finger thing. You know, if how many times have you been on a website and you you tried to tap on a hyperlink and you hit the wrong one, uh, simply because that's where your finger actually you know it, it overlaps uh, and and presses on there, so it's spreading it out some. And that those minor frustrations they become major. People won't come back to your site, right? They they just exactly. they'll, they'll go elsewhere. Yeah. And appropriate sizes uh, for your logos are also very important. And so we provided a source URL so you can read more about that information. User interface designers will often use the term uh, purity for a page, which means just the right amounts of images or fewer images than you might think and more white space. They appreciate navigational simplicity. And so as part of that, people will do subdomains for a particular site. So for example, you could have m dot CIWcertified.com. That the idea, uh, so that it's not a brand new one necessarily, but it's a, it's a subdomain of an existing one. It's very important to prioritize your content. And when I say clear content here, I mean make sure you have a clear message. So you can still prioritize a garbled message. Uh, we see it all the time, don't we, Stephen? Uh, so it's very important to have a very clear idea of what you're trying to to uh, present, uh, to prioritize it, um, and then. There is that argument or, or discussion having to do with mobile domains. Do you have a totally separate domain uh, set up for mobile uh, that you use some sort of programming to redirect mobile phones to, or do you just have a subdomain? I kind of like the subdomain idea, personally. That's, that's, that's where I would go. Now, um, grid computing, and I'm not talking about some form of, you know, big data grid type, you know, massively parallel database here. I'm talking about grid-based layout. It seems to be a very uh, uh, a big trend. And it's, so, it's one way to streamline dev development because you basically set up a grid and, and it, let's say in thirds, you know, going, um, going vertical on the screen. And this example here uh, to, to, to the right on the page is an example of grid-based uh, development. Uh, design, it can be fairly pleasing, pleasing to the eye. And it's very good for mobile development of, of all sorts. Um, and uh, if you go to awards.com, there's a good uh, uh, set of resources available there. Now, so, so let's talk about, Stephen, some tips for uh, mobile-friendly design. Uh, one of the first one is, and uh, I got this, I think it was uh, our own uh, uh, developer, um, Frank Adam, he was saying, you know, I'm not sure I would go with Flash too often. So Stephen, I think you and I have gone back and forth talking about uh, the idea of using Flash. Uh, you know, it doesn't, it tends to, it can work with some Apple devices, but not really. Uh, and, you know, does it make you look unique out on the web if you use Flash? You know, there are a lot of people who really like to slam Flash. I, I, I go back and forth on it because we do a lot of e-learning that uses Flash because it has to be a fairly, it, it tends to be a fairly stable environment, a development environment as well. It's a good, it, they provide a good uh, set of uh, uh, GUI tools that allow you to create, uh, uh, to create, you know, interactive content. But on the other hand, from a consumer perspective, especially on mobile platforms, it can be a real issue. So, Stephen, what do you think? Well, flash uh, the flash topic is basically a whole other webinar discussion all on all on its own. There's there's good <laughs> yeah. things and bad things about flash. Yes, I use flash. Uh, I'm using flash for some of my training that's coming up here for an application that that uh, 
I'm using as part of a generative strategy. But there's when you're when you're talking about designing your website content in pure flash, uh, what what's the message that's coming across? Uh, again, how much is it? How quickly is it going to load? Search engine optimization, accessibility. There there are definitely issues with using flash. And now using the technologies that we were mentioning earlier with with HTML5, CSS3, and, and JavaScript, your, your requirements for interactivity don't necessarily have to hang on, on the implementation of Flash. You can use those technologies to still make your site very interactive and very appealing without a lot of the drawbacks of Flash, whether a device supports it, whether you know your mobile device would have mm -hmm. to require you to install a plug-in before you're able to use it. There's, mm -hmm. um, so, well, there's a lot of technology that we can use in designing without having to rely on Flash. So staying away from it as far as from the mobile platform is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, the yeah, way I see it, uh, so Flash often can be a workaround for some people, and some people just don't like the, the plug-in you know, problem and things like that. So there, there's the, the, you know, I just kind of want to teach the controversy there rather than take a, a particular side, so at least at this, at this point. Call me up, guys, folks, and uh, I'll take a side. So um, it's also uh, a, a typical step is to create a site solely for mobile pages, and um, and so you could use some code uh, to move your devices over to that particular site. It's also important to code hyperlinks so that hovering isn't an issue. Touch sensitive device will interpret someone's finger just hovering over it uh, as an actual action and uh, as a click. So uh, you can solve this problem to make sure that the that the uh, that the hovering uh, that the action that the hovering leads to is the same as an on-click action. So that's something uh, to consider. Also, adapt uh, uh, one screen resolution using the viewport meta tag. And the viewport meta tag is is shown right here. And this is something that I was uh, that I was shown to shown that auto detects the resolution of a mobile device, and you put it at the top of your page before all of the other made attack and you can use it to adjust the web page uh, using one piece of code and that's very convenient uh, your users will thank for thank you for it if you're doing a project uh, um, your uh, project manager will thank you for being able to quickly come up with some code that uh, solves a, a plethora of problems so that's one tip that we wanted to pass uh, pass along here and when it comes to redirecting to a mobile-friendly site, I didn't really want to show any particular code here, but you have a lot of URLs available here. You could do it in many different ways using JavaScript on the, on the client side, probably do it on the server side too. Uh, you can use it using CSS and CSS3. Uh, you could also use uh, program, uh, languages such as uh, PHP uh, and those associated with ASP.NET. You can even use uh, the HP access files that are found in Apache server. So there are URLs that will show various ways uh, to do this. Um, and that, that site redirection is something that I think is, is very important to do. And, and we see examples all the time, don't we, Stephen, of people who don't bother doing that redirection. They'll just, as you said, uh, will we'll say, well, the web is the web, and we will use the same page to present, um, uh, use the same code to present to a, both a mobile site and to a, a notebook uh, or a, uh, a desktop, and usually with disastrous results. We'll see that here in a second. And it all depends on it all depends yeah. on the the design of the site to begin with. You know, if if they're using a good mm. type of design that's pr providing uh, information uh, in in a concise manner, then the mobile device. You know, in those times, those situations, will have the ability to resize the content so that it looks fairly okay within that mobile design, the device. Um, but again, if you've, if you've got a, just a ton of information on that site for the desktop use, then it's, it's really going to come out looking bad on a mobile device. See, it's true. And there's an interesting point. Um, I think it's uh, uh, Meg Prescott, I'm not sure, who uh, uh, asked a question about this, Stephen. It's a, a good thing to, to discuss. Doesn't creating a separate mobile site put us in the, in the same situation as the battle days of writing different sites for different browsers? I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, you remember those days, don't you, when you're like, well, you know, someone's uh, using Netscape or someone's using the, you know, another version of IE. And then remember those days of, well, of, you, well you're using Internet Explorer and we, we're not going to support you guys. That's right, absolutely, and that's yeah. you know the, the days of the browser wars. You know, we made the comment not too long ago when we were talking about browsers. You know, the, 
the browser wars aren't necessarily over, and, because now you've got that whole mobile feature built into it. So, you know, and, and again, using the technology such as HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript that's going to have the ability to auto-sense browser configurations and, and you know, resize, do a lot of resizing for you, that eliminates some of this. But yes, if you're if if you're developing true mobile sites, true desktop sites, you know, they need to be either compatible or they definitely need, you know, if you've got a lot of content, a lot of interactivity and, and, and flash mm -hmm. animation, um, uh, podcasts, whatever, on the uh, on the desktop site, uh, you definitely need to consider your user in a mobile environment. What are they actually trying to do off that mobile site? Uh, what type of information do you yeah. need to prioritize to have available to it and probably scale your design back? If your if your site desktop site is not that necessarily complicated, uh, then then again using uh, HTML5 and CSS3 and JavaScript to resize, or using relying on the mobile browser to resize, um, th there are those considerations to take uh, take into account um, for yeah. design. I think so. I, I think you know if it's not browser wars, it's certainly platform wars. I think we made that point in an, in an earlier uh, webcast how. Uh, it's all coming down to making sure that your pages, uh, you, you can take that fundamental step. My pages are going to be so simple, they will be supported in a mobile site or <laughs> at, in a desktop. But you, you, know, you will take a, uh, aesthetically, a lot of people won't see that as pleasing. So you'll, you'll get, you might get hit on that. But simplicity is king. I noticed that. I went to the, for whatever reason, I was doing some research, the Burger King site, you know, the hamburger site. And uh, on a mobile device, and I noticed it was extremely simple. I mean, like third grade web uh, design simple. But I think the reason they did that was uh, it could be that, uh, as one of our developers, uh, Ashley Kraft, put it, that my phone failed uh, gracefully back to a, a fallback. You know, it could be that. But I noticed that it was so simple, and and yet it it gave me the direction where I needed to go. I mean, if if you go into a, a a site such as that, like the Burger King site, for example, you can pretty much go there uh, to find out where's the closest store. And it did that. Not that I was looking to eat a hamburger there, but uh, I was definitely wanting to see what they were doing in terms of simplicity of design. But uh, uh, to answer the question that Meg had, yeah, uh, I think it does bring us back to the bad old days. In many ways, all of this is kind of a back to the future sort of thing. We all, uh, some people anyway, remember the browser wars. And we're kind of back there with the platform wars, but and and the way to do it is to make a, a decision, either make it so simple, or to go to uh, develop two totally separate sites. And I think most people are going to developing separate sites. I think one of the keys here in 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 determining uh, mobile phone support is testing, and that's very very important. And there are a lot of different uh, uh, sites out there that allow you to test how your pages look. Uh, I've provided a screenshot here, uh, Stephen, of Google's, uh, a Google's testing site. And it's a good one, uh, Mobilizer. And you can see the URL for that. For those who are designing the iPads, uh, iPad Peak's a good one, iPhone is an iPhone as well. These sites are not foolproof. I mean, ideally, of course, you're going to have people with real iPhones sitting there you know, checking them. But these are great sites that allow you to do that kind of testing. Additional resources include Mobi Ready, Dot Mobi, and uh, even the uh, Opera Mini Simulator. Stephen, do you do you use Opera much, uh, or is it Opera? I, I don't know which to call it. Maybe Oprah Winfrey will get mad at us for for, for, for calling it that. I don't use it. I, I don't use that. I, route. I, a lot of folks like it. Right. I was using it there for a while, uh, but but actually okay. I'm not using it right now at all. Um, I'm using uh, actually uh, what you referred to me as Dolphin. Ah. The Dolphin web browser, I think that's a terrific web browser uh, for Android devices anyway. Just look at it, for it up at the Marketplace or, or uh, Google Play or whatever they're calling it these days. Now, uh, when it comes to testing, uh, you can do more heavy-duty testing. The, uh, the uh, Squish is an application that can do a little bit more than your typical, well, it looks good or it doesn't look good. Uh, Squish uh, is for what they call regression testing, which does more than UI, user in, uh, interface testing. Does automatic test of code, uh, and that code can be JavaScript, Perl, Python, all all the fun stuff. And you can go to froglogic.com to uh, uh, take a look at that particular tool. 
And then, of course, code validation. How many times, Stephen, do we say that when we're in classes? Right? Well, did you validate your code? Right? And even though validated code doesn't necessarily guarantee that uh, that code will look great in a browser, right? it determines that you do have valid code and that will have a, a very good effect on the page. And so you can go to the, uh, the mobile version of the validator and that's something that's very important to consider. Let's talk a bit about development environments. Stephen, what do you know about some of the development environments that are out there? Uh, personally, I think you and I, we tend to think the best uh, development environment is a good, good, uh, good text editor <laughs> still. But it, there are, it is, uh, sure. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's a great way to go. Um, but of course, if you're doing uh, a more sophisticated development, IBM's Eclipse uh, and also uh, NetBeam.org has a, a great a development environment, and then uh, we've provided a Mashable.com uh, cross-platform uh, development tools link here that will tell you a bit more about development uh, environments that are used out there. And I think as you get employed, and when I say you, I mean people out in the field get employed, uh, there are certain development environments that you're going to be asked to use. And uh, so some people might be in a more of a Java house, and so something, uh, both Eclipse and NetBeans are going to be very uh, friendly to that particular approach and language. And these development environments, what they do is they bring in multiple tools under one GUI, and I think that's one reason why Flash has been so successful. Besides the fact that people like to, a lot of people do like to look at Flash, the reason why Flash has been so successful is Adobe created a terrific development environment that allows developers to do really cool and creative things. This point has not been lost on IBM and, and by other organizations. And so that's why they create multiple development environments. And uh, Stephen, I think as usual, our advice would be start downloading them and mess with them and see what you can, uh, see what you can use. And, and, and it, it, after a while, it comes down to things like personal preference concerning your development environment. I think it also comes down to what your company is using. And then <laughs> if they're using it, of course, you have to use it too. Well, and it also has to, you know, there, there's there's also platform-specific tools out there that's available, too. I believe um, uh, Nokia has their own uh, platform tool or development tool, you know, specifically for Nokia devices. Uh, you know, if you know your target audience is all using Nokia. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. And, uh, in fact, we'll be seeing some things having to do with, uh, uh, now, are you s suggesting that we can develop right in the device as well, you know, like with Photoshop Express and Pixay Pro, right, and things like that? Absolutely. Or did you have a different, yeah. Now, I, Pixay Pro, using that, um, it was, that's a lot of fun. I just grab an image that I have, I have created on my phone, and then I can develop, it's fairly simplistic, but you can do some really cool things and at least put together some good, um, how do you want to call it, templates, design templates and good prototypes uh, as you're, you know, uh, moving from the wireframing or planning stage into prototyping. It's very useful because you can say, well, I created it on this phone. Chances are it's going to look pretty good on this phone, on this particular form factor. It's a great way to speed up a lot of that development, uh, at least beginning development uh, process because you can conduct very useful test using uh, things such as Pixay Pro or Pixay and then Photoshop Express. So you can develop right within the tablet or right within the phone. Um, uh, we often have to repeat ourselves uh, as we're uh, out there instructing people, don't we, Stephen? So testing and validation is essential. Yeah, I know we just talked about it, but people, they forget from one, uh, it seems, from one moment to the next to develop, to, uh, to, uh, Validate code. It's so Just very like important. When you're in the classroom, repetition is a good thing. It helps think the point in. <laughs> it sure can be. Well, let's take a look at some of the sites that we can emulate uh, um, uh, that that I think do some pretty cool stuff. I did a bit of research out on the web. Uh, also talking with uh, a few people who design for uh, for mobile platforms. Uh, one of them at the Apollo Group. Uh, they do the University of Phoenix, and they love the idea of simplicity. And you'll notice this uh, VW.com example. You see the, all the white space that, uh, that's there. And notice the simplicity there. And when, uh, when we write uh, it's all in the choices, we're basically saying Volkswagen has you know, put a lot of malice and forethought into this particular uh, page, into this particular uh, mobile presence. And they've made some choices to say, well, what do we want to emphasize? Well, 
our cars, we have a dealer network, and people will want some form of assistance, whether in buying a car, in servicing their car, or some sort of question about what they've bought. So here is a very simple site that has um, clearly uh, one image might be divided into multiple pieces on the download. One major image, it has fairly simple iconography, a lot of white space. And notice that they really have kind of divided it at least horizontally, right, into kind of a top, you know, middle top, middle where the image is, and then the bottom, you know, where it says our cars, find the dealer. It's a very simple uh, layout. It's one that I like. I don't know, Stephen, uh, you know, your thumbs up or thumbs down. What do you think? No, I'm good with it. There's one thing that we, we want to you know, definitely reiterate, talking about the old days of technology and everything. You know, back in the day of web design, when we were starting out with web design, we were talking about the three-click rule. Remember the three-click rule? Being able to find information fast you know, for, for user satisfaction. I think that point is definitely worth reiterating on mobile design. You want, some, you want your end user to be able to find what it is they're looking for on your mobile site quickly and easily and efficiently. That's going to bring them back in, the, in here. You know, I, I, I think about when we were shopping for my daughter's clothes a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my wife, you know, we were, we, were, we were up in Pigeon Forge and we were going through all the outlet malls and, and my wife saw a store that she wanted to go to and she said, give me your phone, you know, and she was going online to see if she could find, you know, if they had any online coupons, you know, on that store site. And she wanted that information quickly. And, and so being able to find that information off of a mobile site makes it, you know, the, the, the simpler the site, the easier to navigate the site, and to find information is key for a mobile plant, mobile uh, design. You bet. It goes back to knowing your audience and then people on the run, they don't care about how feature rich the site is. <laughs> they exactly. just want their info and they want to get away as quickly as possible. <clears throat> so. Uh, Volkswagen, Burger King is one. CBS News does a fairly good job and big. Those are all ones that, uh, and those aren't just necessarily Stephen's opinions or James's opinions. Those are opinions that are, uh, have been, uh, we, we looked at a lot of different uh, uh, sites out there uh, giving thumbs up or thumbs down on sites. And those seem to be the, the ones that most people have in common with what they like. Now, this is actually one of my uh, choices. I like uh, doing a lot of kayaking. And the Austin Kayak site, I think, does a fairly good job. It's readable uh, for old eyes like mine. It still provides a lot of information. Uh, it's an easily navigable uh, uh, mobile site. Why is user space? Notice new products. Everybody wants to do new all the time, right? They sell something new. Uh, and notice how that is right up at the top. And they know that people obviously are going to come if they're interested uh, to a website about kayaking. So that's the next choice. And people are often going to camp out of there. So you can see uh, that they need to go somewhere with their kayak. And so trailers and racks and things like that. So you can see that they've thought pretty carefully about their design. Scuba.com does a pretty good job, and MSNBC. These are other uh, examples. As you can see, I like uh, uh, water sports. But Stephen, what are your thoughts about this particular, you know, set of pages? Uh, the Scuba.com site. You can see um, the one in the middle. Again, a lot of people like to buy things as packages, and so they've kind of gone through and prioritized, probably from their server logs and from requests. Uh, you know, they know what people come in and ask for, and so they've prioritized those here. And then there's the one on the left that shows if you're going to get ready to buy something. They've made it very simple to check out with a typical visa or, of course, check out with PayPal. Uh, it's a fairly uh, user-friendly sort of site. It is. They've done their homework, and exactly what mm -hmm. you said, they've, they've done their research on audience preferences. What are the users looking at? What are they doing on their site? So they've been able to go, just like what you said on that middle screenshot, where they prioritize content, make, make it easily to find information that their typical end audience, end users, will expect to find or the type of information they want to see when they go to the site. Mm -hmm. the, MSN, uh, the MSNBC uh, website does a fairly good job. And I think, too, in providing a display that is fairly navigable uh, that uses uh, more than just text-based navigation. You'll notice the one on the left at the scuba.com, a lot of that navigation is text-based, whereas uh, with the MSNBC, it's a, a, a little more sophisticated, sort of touch-friendly 
uh, environment. But you see, they also use a lot of white space as well. Uh, they space things out. And again, it's all going to be on the choices about you know what hot topic to, to choose. Um, additional uh, sites that are out there. Um, uh, we had, uh, uh, in doing some research, uh, Moa Marketing uh, uses the .mobi extension uh, for its uh, mobile environment. They automatically redirect mobile devices to that. And the screen capture I grabbed from my, from my phone. And you can see what they've done is, in doing marketing, they know that they need to show samples of work, who they work with, and their specific expertise, their specific skills. And so you can see right away they direct your eye right to those three three, three things. The three shires in up in the north of uh, north of England, um, they do a pretty good job in showing. Look, here's where we are, but here's when uh, under accommodation where you can go and um, right away find out what the rooms look like. Uh, uh, um, book a room. Uh, you can also uh, look and see all of the different. Uh, off things that they offer here. So they've done a pretty good job in showing some, um, some simplicity of design and yet able to get across quite a bit of information and pretty good looking branding as well. Well, some samples to avoid. And this, of course, is uh, all about opinion. So uh, if, you, if you disagree, great. Let's, let's hear about what you uh, might like about some of these things. But to me, this is a chatty Cathy page. And by Chatty Cathy, check out what Johns Hopkins, a really good hospital, right? If I'm sick, I wouldn't mind being taken care of by the folks at Johns Hopkins. I don't think I would allow them to do my web design, though. Okay? So there are some reasons why they've done what they've done here. Accessibility to information and accessibility to patients who, uh, with needs is very important, and that's why they've gone with a text-based. Thing. But notice those numbers, right? Not very aesthetically pleasing. It might be easy for people to identify all of those features, but certainly I think there's probably a better way to do it. And they're trying to present too much information on one page. Um, I, I like the idea of having search available right from the initial page. You know, Stephen, uh, there's so many. Uh, uh, when you talked about the three-click rule, there are so many people uh, that will bury a search functionality, you know, six clicks in or, or you know, who knows where into a site, whether that be a mobile site or a, a traditional one. But uh, so I, I like what they're trying to do here to make uh, information available. But my goodness, it seems that there needs to be a little bit more prioritization of the information. There needs to be more prioritization, James. And, and, and for an old guy like me on my Droid phone, when, when I would pull up this page, I would have to, you know, do that pinch and spread and, 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 and drag out so I could zoom in to read what my options are. And, of course, any time I was trying to do that, it would also register as a tap on one of those links. And, you know, then it would try loading another page or whatever. So it's, <laughs> it's definitely uh, layout. It's, it, it's small print um, on, a, on a mobile device. And when you're trying to go into uh, John Hopkins and try and find some basic information, uh, you'd end up more frustrated than you would uh, anything else. My biggest tool on that page would be, as you said, the search, because then I could type in it, pull up my keyboard, and actually put in yeah. that I was uh, looking for instead of having to try and navigate through the links they provide. That's right. That's right. I think um, uh, we, we've mentioned white space a few times already and, and how good it is, but I mean really. In, in this <laughs> case, uh, we we have an example of, uh, I think, some development gone wrong. But, uh, but here's the thing. It's not just this one person that I'm picking on. It's, I've seen this in many pages where they're trying to be very elegant. And uh, there's a fine line between being elegant and pithy and uh, choosing your words and then having nothing to say at all. Okay. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, Stephen. I was just going to say, you know, white space in, in design, you know, helps is a tool to help you lead the, the visitor, the user, to you know, key information that you want to uh, bring out. You know, it improves readability, but you know, too much is, well, <laughs> too much. <laughs> too much of a good thing. And speaking of uh, too much, you mentioned that a lot of times people will try to take that idea of, well, we already got a page. The web is the web. Let's you know, let's bang that into a mobile phone or a tablet and see what happens. And so this is a screenshot that I grabbed from uh, from my HTC phone and my Android phone uh, of yet another uh, kayaking outfit. Great uh, outfit, really cool uh, 
both down in Portland, Oregon. Uh, but holy Moses, I mean, you know, lots of words. And they've got a cool image there, if you can see it, of somebody uh, surfing a huge wave and all that fun stuff. But what are they trying to do here? Where are the products? There seems to be no sense of priority. And, and can you read that particular uh, image on, on a mobile phone? Right. Uh, are the colors conducive? Yeah. So and and I'm picking on the poor guys at Alder Creek, and they'll probably next time I walk in, you know, kind of not want to serve me because I've slammed their website. But these these folks are not at all unique in terms of uh, some of the decisions, uh, uh, and I think poor decisions uh, that they've made. We've got a you know just another oh, example yeah. of that is, is locally in in Knoxville. One of our one of our local TV stations, their local. The, the local news channel, uh, they have a really good desktop website that I typically will click on when I'm on my computer and check headlines or check the weather. The thing about uh, their mobile site is they just try to take that, that desktop site and figure out how to stick it into the mobile uh, platform, and, and it is it's really bad. It's really bad. Uh, my wife even said we were trying to check a, a status of some storm warning just a couple of weeks ago, and she was trying to pull up the, the local station on, on uh, my phone, and she said, no, you know, let's try something else. Let's try another site that's, you know, not helping us out at all. Uh, so, you know, so it's not just, it's not just retail stores that, are, that make those not necessarily right decisions for the mobile design, um, and, and every industry needs to take that into consideration. You bet. And I think a lot of times it's just no decision at all, right, becomes a decision. Right. Exactly. They, 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 they haven't uh, prioritized or done that. And then there's some sites that kind of don't make up their, can't make up their mind or maybe are a little too ambitious. Uh, ABC News, when that site works on my particular phone, uh, looks fine. But notice the, on the left, the image on the left. See how it's uh, a, a very simple and, and very clunky. And then the, on the one on the right, that's when the page shows up properly. And you might say, well, James, that's just because your phone happens to have a problem with ABC news.com doesn't mean everybody else does. I don't know. I've, I've talked to quite a few folks who have um, noticed a kind of a Russian roulette navigation situation where they go to the same site, same URL, and it will sometimes show them uh, a, a, a very basic site, a very nice looking site, and then it'll ask them, well, download our app, and, and you'll always get a more consistent sort of thing. And that happens again and again as they go to the same URL. So it's kind of hard to tell what you're going to get. It's like, uh, you know, to me, life on, a mo on the mobile web should not be like a box of chocolates, as Forrest Gump would say. You know, you, you don't want to never know what you're going to get. You, you want to know consistently what you're going to get. So uh, what I think what has happened here is that ABC News has gotten, at least in my case of my phone, a little ambitious and has a, a fairly clunky um, uh, user experience. And I've noticed a couple other users have the same sort of issue there. So it's something to think about. Don't get too ambitious. Well, we've got some resources available. Uh, and uh, for those of you, again, who are on this uh, webcast, you can, you'll be able to take a look at some of these resources that we found. Cool home pages, marquee.com, Dross Designs, and some examples of you know, good-looking uh, uh, websites. Six Revisions, Applico, and, and WebMonkey has done a pretty good job of moving their advice over from uh, traditional to uh, uh, mobile design. So you'll be able to get a chance to uh, take a look at all of those once you get this downloaded to you. Well, how do you get there with CIW? We're updating our site development associate course even as we speak to teach these very concepts. And so it's right within foundations. You are going to get all you need to know about getting started with mobile design. We also offer through our web design specialist course all of the knowledge you need for uh, development environments uh, from Microsoft, uh, uh, Flash-oriented, open source, and also JavaScript to uh, learn all you need to know about designing in a mobile environment. We have a, a JavaScript certification that teaches uh, um, all of the things that you need to know, including jQuery, uh, in providing the right kind of access to mobile platforms. Well, Stephen, uh, see, we've got another webinar coming up, don't we, uh, April 25th, talking about teaching the future of the web, uh, specifically about the new site development associate certification. So we welcome all of you uh, to come to that. And so Stephen and I, we're definitely looking uh, forward to seeing you there. Um, any questions? Just one more oh. shameless, uh, shameless plug. Um, we like shameless plugs. 
we've got a we've, right. we've got a specialty uh, webinar coming up on April the 11th. That's right. Uh, at the same time for our, for our CIW customers out there, if you would like to learn more about some of the CIW online resources, we're gonna we're gonna spend some time talking about them. So so that's kind of in addition to our regular webinar series that will be out there. And again, that'll be on April 11. And if you are interested in it, then uh, give us a contact, and we'll send you the link to the invite. And you can go to CIWcertified.com for uh, for that special webinar on April 11th, can't you? Correct. Uh, to register for it, right? So I've just texted everybody uh, uh, that on April 11th we do have another webinar. In fact, I've got the, uh, the invite to that, so you'll have to put up with me on that one too, Steve. Um, so that's right, April 11th we have one, and also one about the new uh, SDA, the new Site De uh, Development Associate Certification, to learn all about what we're doing there. And you can sign up at CIWcertified.com. Well, uh, what questions do folks uh, have, uh, Lisa? I tried to answer one, and then there was another question, I think it was from Ben, asking about suggestions for development environments for both Mac and PC. NetBeans.org has a pretty good one that will work on uh, both Mac and PC. And uh, Flash is another one that if you want to go that direction. Um, I wouldn't personally, but it's certainly uh, uh, an environment that's out there uh, that can do uh, some pretty impressive things. Right. Um, I'm kind of reviewing some of our questions that have come in since since we started. Uh, I believe you covered. Um, go ahead, Lisa. Sorry. I was going to say I think you already talked about uh, Jada's uh, question about why Flash is a controversial topic in top terms of mobile design. Yeah, and uh, Meg mentioned uh, that Appena is a great choice for uh, development environment, so I wanted to bring that up mm -hmm. as well. Right. So I think we're pretty good on the questions front. Now, uh, yeah. check out this little link that we have. Um, we're using we're doing a survey uh, uh, using SurveyMonkey uh, to make our webinars even better. You can get a fifty dollars Visa gift certificate uh, if you uh, click on the following link. Uh, go to uh, www.surveymonkey.com forward slash s and then CIW Mobile and CIW is in caps. So go ahead and grab that link. It'll be that link will also be made available to you. Um, again, so that you can click on it. But uh, go and check that out. Uh, we'd like to hear from you, get some uh, advice from you, some ideas from you about uh, about the particular survey. Uh, so thank you, everybody, very much for your time. Uh, uh, Steve and I uh, really appreciate uh, your time, and we're uh, it's always fun doing this. Stephen, it's always a lot of fun talking with you about, uh, in this case, design. So. Uh, it's a, it's a good mm -hmm. topic. Uh, our other topic coming up um, is going to be a lot of fun too. Talking about the site development associate um, and moving the HTML5 and CSS3. I think it's going to be a great, great time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's going to be a, a, a more pure sort of course. So, Lisa, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to work with you on this as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any other last minute uh, advice or any uh, last minute words for anybody, Lisa? Uh, not right now, just to remind everyone that we will try to email out a uh, copy of a PDF of the slide presentation. We'll try to get that out later today or, or else early tomorrow. Um, we have been recording this event, and we will post it on our website within a few days. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and, and I hope we managed to answer everyone's questions. Um, a lot of stuff was covered in this session, so feel free to take a look at our, our recording when it goes up. Fantastic. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and uh, LinkedIn, and, of course, YouTube. Take care, everybody. All right. Bye. All right. Thank you.